Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on gynaecology. My name is Sarah. I'm a surgical care practitioner and our expert presenter is consultant gynaecologist, Mr. Abhishek Gupta. This presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. Please note the session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you would like to book a consultation, we'll provide you contact details at the end of the session. I'll now hand over to Mr. Abhishek Gupta and you'll hear from me again shortly. Thank you, Sarah. So, um, so just, just a brief overview of uh, this session um, and uh, that will start with me telling you a bit more uh, about who I am. Uh, then uh, I, I'm, we're going to discuss a common um, gynecological issues and their potential investigation treatment. These are the commonest uh, referrals which we get from patients and what uh, kind of treatment are available at Barron Hospital and what to expect. And then one of the patients had kindly um, given uh, her testimonials, which also helps you to understand the pathway and how the Benadryl Hospital uh, works. And then um, what's, and if you come and attend Benadryl Hospital, we work as a team. So um, obviously I'm the consultant, one of the consultants here, then surgical care practitioner with Sarah who looks after your referrals. She also helps me in theater um, for assisting. She does your pre-op pre -op assessment, goes through the procedure with you, comes and sees you during the pre-op operation, post-op uh, care, and also does a, a set of um, uh, follow-ups for some patients. She's also um, uh, with the team with one of our, a few, three of our other continence care nurse specialists who take care of the patients with incontinence and prolapse. So we work pretty much as a team here. And then obviously, if you have any questions, we'll like to answer as much as possible to the best of our abilities. So a bit about myself. I'm a consultant gynecologist. I've been a consultant for almost 11 years now. Um, I did my specialist training in Southeast London rotation and guidance St. Thomas's was uh, the tertiary hospital for my rotation. Uh, I'm a consultant gynecologist and also um, urogynecologist, uh, which is we deal with prolapse, with my special interest is dealing with process and incontinence, and I'm a urogynic lead at uh, my NHS Trust. And I do also I do laparoscopic um, um, surgeries. Uh, and I've done the, the Royal College Advanced okay. training in vaginal surgery, urogynecology, and abdominal surgery, both lap open and laparoscopy. I'm a member of British Society of Urogynecology and also um, Royal College of Obstetrician Gynecology. That's, so that's my brief uh, background. So what are the commonest referrals we get uh, in our practices here? So the commonest referral we get is for heavy painful periods, which is which is quite common as you would expect. Um, then we have uh, referrals for fibroid, which may, may, or, may or may not be related with heavy painful period, but I'd like to quite talk to you so that you, you have a knowledge of what fibroids are, when they need treatment, when they don't need treatment, and what to expect. Ovarian cyst is quite a common one. And that sometimes panics patients as well when they get diagnosed with um, uh, ovarian cyst. Polycystic ovaries, um, they get diagnosed uh, slightly um, on, a, on over diagnosis. And there are some kind of myths as well around polycystic ovaries and where to get information because um, and I would like to address that. Then pelvic pain, which may be causing from other reasons as well, which is ovarian cyst and fiber uterus because they are intermittent, but uh, something called endometriosis we'll talk about. Uh, pelvic inflammatory disease uh, is secondary to infection. We see less of that in uh, in, a, in in a gynae setting here. More of the pelvic infections people see is as an emergency um, in um, in NHS um, as uh, emergency hospitals. And I'll touch base on menopause. And um, I do a separate webinar because urogynecology issue, which is incontinent prolapse itself, is a very big subject to be covered in the next half an hour or so. But I'll try to do a brief outline here. But I, I, do, I have done previously um, a full webinar on incontinence and prolapses, and that will still be available for you to, to, to uh, view. Uh, and we'll repeat it in future as well, obviously. So... What are heavy and painful period? What is heavy period? I think it's very difficult to quantify what is heavy for, for someone and not heavy for someone. So it's quite subjective. So if you feel that your periods are affecting your quality of life because they're really heavy 
for your own standards and you're passing a lot of clots, that means they're heavy. The other uh, sides are they're getting you tired, that maybe we take your blood counts and then your hemoglobin, which is uh, on blood, may be coming down. Uh, but it's very subjective and patients are the best judge of how heavy their periods are. And when you get heavy periods and you get referred for heavy periods or painful periods, um, the commonest thing we take is history because we want to see how heavy and painful they are. How is your period? Are they regular, irregular? How long they last? And then we also discuss, um, then we do a common examination because we want to see the neck of the room just to make sure there's no um, abnormality on the neck of the room until unless you had a very recent smear test that we know there is no abnormality on the neck of the room. And then examination can say what the size of the womb looks like. You usually get an ultrasound scan to make sure that the lining of the womb is fine and then you don't have any fibroids, which are muscle mass, which is a lump of muscle mass on the womb. And once we ruled all of this out, then once the, the causes of um, the heavy periods are ruled out, uh, then usually this is uh, then uh, labeled as dysfunctional uterine bleeding. What that means is that uh, there is no obvious pathology causing heaviness of the bleeding. And that usually is because of a slight disruption at the molecular level uh, on your womb, which stops the blood flow, which, which, which prevents you stopping the blood flow in a timely fashion. Uh, it can be dealt with a simple medication like tranexamic acid, which helps to, to change that uh, uh, molecular level clotting mechanism on your womb. And this can be prescribed by your GP. And it's a non-hormonal medication, which can be only taken during your periods on the days which are heavy. It doesn't stop you um, uh, getting pregnant. So if you're planning for a pregnancy and you have a heavy period, you rule out any pathology, then you can start the tranexamic acid. It can combine with something called mephenomic acid or other um, uh, anti-inflammatories like, uh, like naproxen uh, during the period. And they work in synergy together, which can help together with loss of um, heaviness of the period and also may give you a good pain control. And again, this, this needs to be taken only when the days are heavy. Uh, then if that doesn't work, and obviously if you are not planning for pregnancy in, um, in a recent future, then you can have either, then you can try the, the um, hormones, which can be either the contraceptive pills, which can be combined or even progesterone only pills if you have any side effects of a combined pills, or you can have an implant or depo injection, or you can have a mirena coil cytidine, which is um, a hormone containing coil. The advantage of mirena coil is it's a local coil. So the hormone which gets secreted is secreted in a controlled fashion and it acts locally around the womb. So amount which comes in your bloodstream is so small that doesn't get any systemic side effects effective for almost 80% of the patients. Um, so four in five patients are happy with the score. Uh, the periods are much lighter. Some people do have, do have um, the period stops. Uh, and when you want to get pregnant in the future, when the coil is removed, your uh, fertility returns back to normal very quickly. So that's an advantage of the coil. Then if things don't work, then we are talking about the surgical option, um, which we obviously have to reserve for patients if they are, if they are um, not contemplating pregnancy. Um, so what is ablation? Well, ablation is a procedure where basically we have a look inside the womb with the camera and then use a technique called NovaShore, which is with the radio frequency waves, it basically burns the lining of the womb. And 80% of the patients either stop the period straight away or the periods become much lighter. This is a good option as long as your womb is the, the anatomy of the womb is not disturbed because of fibroids. Yeah. And uh, this is only applicable and only um, offered for patients who have then completed their family because after this, highly unlikely you'll get pregnant, though this is not contraception. Then hysterectomy is a major surgery, but we do it routinely if things about things don't work on patients. And that's a gold standard. If you have a hysterectomy, you will not have periods. Myomectomy is a procedure to, to remove the fibroids if you have chunky fibroids causing heavy period. And this is only, and this I will only recommend if you are desirous of future fertility and you've got big fibroids. But we'll talk about fibroids in a minute. 
So as I said, we'll talk about fibroids in, in a minute. So it nicely leads to, to fibroid, which um, are fibroids are mainly the benign kind of muscular growth on the womb. So if you look into this slide, there are three kinds of fibroid. One you will see on the top, which is called, uh, which is here, which is called pedunculated fibroid, which is a fibroid on the surface, which has small stalk. Uh, so that is the muscles of the womb. That's the lining of the womb. That's your neck of the womb, and that's the vagina. That's the anatomy. This fibroid here is called submucosal, which is now disturbing the lining of the womb. And this fibroids can cause heaviness of the period. This fibroid, which is in the line, which is on the surface of the womb, this one and this one, they usually don't cause any heaviness of the period. They can cause discomfort, and if they're large, can present with a pressure effect like pressure or uh, like discomfort in the pelvic region, or they can also present sometimes um, 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 pressure on your bladder. So you may go for water whisper not, of, not often, and it may uh, be uncomfortable for you. But this are uh, the pressure effect on a large fibroid, but usually they don't cause heavy periods. The fibroid here, which is inside the lining of the womb, which is called submucosal, this one and this one, or the mus on the muscle, which is called intramural. So one in the muscles are intramural, one in the lining of the womb is submucosal, and one on the surface of the womb is called subserosal or pedunculated. So these two fibroids can cause heavy periods, and they can also cause, um, uh, if they are big, they can still cause pressure effect. Submucosal fibroid can also cause you bleeding in between your periods, and uh, the pain with fibroid is usually either discomfort from pressure or sometimes when the blood supply to the fibroid gets stopped, it can cause pain because of degeneration of fibroid. Um, if it's uh, in the cavity here, which is submucosal, or it is a big mass, which is stopping your um, tubes um, or in preventing the embryo to get implanted here, can cause fertility issues. Now, treatment for the fibroid is depend on where the fibroids are, what symptoms you are getting. So you've got small fibroids, for example, and, and some people have pain in the abdomen. And I get referred because you had pain in the abdomen, you get an ultrasound, you are, you are in the menopausal age group, you get a scan from um, scan, you pick up fibroids, three to four centimeter, intramural of subserosal, and then get referred because that's fibroid which is picked up incidentally. Now this fibroid probably Fibroids don't grow after you go into menopause. So they are usually during your reproductive age group. So if you go into menopause and have small four, three, four, four, five centimeter fibroid, they usually don't cause any problem and doesn't need any treatment. And fibroids are very common. Um, the non-surgical, the, therefore, fibroids which are not causing any symptoms can be treated as non-surgical route, which is observation. If they're causing a bit of heaviness or period and pain, you can take symptomatic treatment like what I talked about, neuro, um, uh, tranexamic acid, the pain relief medication, or um, 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 simple analgesia. Now, if they're causing real trouble to you, then depending on where the fibroids are and what stage of reproductive age group you are, then we decide what next to be done. So if you're getting heavy periods and the fibroids are on the lining of the womb, we recommend you to have a, a what is called transcervical resection fibroid, which is TCRF. So it's done in general anesthetic. We have we put a camera through your neck of the womb, inside the womb, and then we use saline to expand this area. And thus we remove this fibroid with with uh, um, with cutting it off piece by piece, like shaving the fibroid out. This procedure is called resection fibroid. It's a day case procedure. And you can be going home on the same day. It takes a week or ten days to recover. So it's a it's it's a day case procedure. If you have to remove the fibroid on the muscles of the womb or on the surface of the womb, then that's called myomectomy. It's quite a major operation, uh, and it's as major as hysterectomy, if not more. Um, fibroids are quite notorious with their blood supply, and once the myomectomy is done, it leaves a quite a significant scarring on the womb. So if you ever have to have a further hysterectomy or any other procedure after my myomectomy, there is a quite a bit of scarring. So I re I, I recommend myomectomies, if it's a symptomatic fibroid myomectomies, to be offered to patients who have uh, not completed their family and fibroids are causing, their problem, uh, are causing problems to them. If you have completed your family, then myomectomies are not 
the best options. Myomectomies can be done under laparoscopic uh, uh, keyhole or open. Uh, keyhole myomectomies are usually for a single fibroid, around six, seven centimeter, but if you have multiple big fibroids, open surgery uh, is usually what is recommended. And then hysterectomy is, is always a, um, um, a last resort to go through. Uh, if the fibroids are big or they're causing trouble and you're completely a family, we can um, then think about going for hysterectomy, which is a major surgery. But, uh, and, and as long as your womb is not really big, i.e. Uh, not above, uh, from not coming up, up from pelvis to the tummy, then most of the hysterectomies are done uh, through keyhole surgeries. However, if, if the fibroids are really big and they're distorting the anatomy completely, then we'll have to resort to a traditional open technique of hysterectomy. The last option for a my for fibroid treatment is called uterine nitrate embolization, which is through this is a radiological technique where we put a, um, where it's not done by gynecologist, it's done by radiologist, and we don't offer that at Panadol, but some of the other places do. And this where radiologists the uh, with the the control of uh, scan, they put little um, particles which stops the blood supply to the fibroid and it shrinks the fibroid uh, slightly and may cause you, um, it won't take the fibroids away. It's not going to stop uh, the fibroids completely. Not all fibroids are suitable for this treatment, but it may shrink the fibroid and give you some relief, but that's also one of the options. Then the next common referrals I get, uh, or we get is for ovarian cyst. So in this diagram, that's the wound, that's the, the tube, which is called fallopian tube, which takes the egg from the tube back to the uterus, and that's the ovary. That's a, that's a small cyst which is shown in the ovary. This is a really small cyst. This is called simple cyst or follicle cyst. Now, a lot of scans, if you have, especially in the reproductive age group, or even after that, you will find a small cyst. Uh, 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 you will not uncommonly form a small cyst, which is called follicular cyst. It's a physiological cyst. So anybody who produces an egg every cycle will form a small cyst. Up to five centimeter simple cyst is normal, and we often don't have to treat it because it, most of them get resolved. So all you need is an interval scan in four to six months to ensure the cyst is not growing up in size. And if the cyst does grow up in size, we may have to um, resort to treating it with a keyhole surgery. Then other cysts which are common are mucinous kind of cysts, which are again benign, uh, which is slightly different because uh, that's mucin collection inside. Endometriomas are slightly different. Endometrioma um, are a cyst which is um, also called chocolate cyst, which is cyst uh, where the lining of the womb, which is called endometrium, endometrium, are also sometimes formed in the pelvis of human being. And in this, it can form a cyst in the ovary, which is then like shedding your lining of the womb or bleeding inside the cyst, which is called endometrioma. Endometriomas can cause pain, and uh, endometriomas um, uh, are um, part of endometriosis. It's also endometriosis. And if it's symptomatic, then we may have to do, we will have to do a treatment. And the most of the endometriosis, endometrioma are treated by keyhole surgery. Either we take the cyst out and do the treatment uh, with a keyhole surgery. And if you have completed your family and you are near the menopause, then uh, and if the endometriosis is quite severe, then we may talk to you about removing the ovary and endometriosis or offering a hysterectomy, depending on what operation you had and what is uh, your fertility options and uh, various things. But standard for a young patient, if you have got endometrioma, the first treatment is do a keyhole surgery and take the cyst out. The dermoid cysts are very common. What is dermoid cyst? As you can see, ovary produces egg, and then when it meets sperm, it produces the, um, it, produ it, it um, um, gets an embryo, and from embryo, the whole, whole human being develop. So the ovaries have the cells which can develop them to anything, uh, and that's called uh, germ cells. So what dermoid cysts do is, um, dermoid cysts are from this, little germ cells, anything can develop. So there's a cyst form which can have like sea, um, sebaceous material, which is like your sweat. It sometimes has hairs, it sometimes can, can get bone, and it can, um, it can sometimes have uh, teeth and various kinds of things. So anything which is from a germ cell can develop, it can have in dermoid cyst. Spoiled dermoid cyst can be left, 
But if it's larger moistures, then we often uh, offer you a laparoscopy and, and remove of uh, or keyhole surgery and remove this cyst. If the dermoid cysts have gone quite big, i.e. roughly eight to nine centimeter and anything between seven and nine centimeter and above, then we try to then um, offer you open surgery because it's sometimes very difficult to remove um, a big cyst um, which has got all these elements in it and clean through keyhole surgery because it can leave a lot of mess. And therefore it's much easier to give a small cut and take the cyst out. But anything below six, cent six to seven centimeter can be done laparoscopically. Uh, then some, there's something called borderline ovarian tumors, which exactly we don't know what, um, what um, they're going to be um, like. So we don't know whether they, they have an abnormal element to it, but it's not enough to call it cancer. We don't know whether it is uh, going to be um, going to um, uh, progress into cancer in future or not. So if you have any borderline ovarian tumor, which is um, suspicious, then we usually remove the ovary, and then you will need to have um, um, medium to long-term follow-up to make sure that they're not coming back. And last is cancer. So um, if you have ovarian cyst or anything, um, especially um, in uh, perimenopausal and later age group after menopause, then worth getting it checked because um, uh, ovarian cyst and ovarian cancer can be quite silent and can present quite late. So what are the commonest investigation? Ultrasound scan is quite good for most ovarian cysts. Occasionally ultrasound scan when the cyst is complex, i.e. E., there are elements of some cystic elements, some uh, solid elements, or the septation, then we are not sure what the cyst does, and then we take the help of modalities like CT scan and MRI. Um, for some of the large cysts, or if the cysts are formed towards um, um, towards the end, uh, towards uh, menopausal age group patients, then we may need to do some tumor markers, which are tests like CA125, uh, and if it's a big cyst in a very early age group, then we do germ cell tumor markers like uh, alpha fetoprotein and HCG. That's to make sure that they are screening tests to make sure that this is um, nothing to be worried about. And as we did, uh, as we were going through different kinds of cyst, um, I was talking about the treatment. It depends on, really depends on the type of the cyst. Either we leave it and uh, repeat a scan and see what's going on. And if it's symptomatic and it's last site, then it needs to come out, which is depending on what kind of cyst other we do we take it laparoscopically or open surgery. Then next is a polycystic ovary syndrome, or uh, polycystic ovaries. This is this is a quite a fascinating subject um, because polycystic ovaries. Um, uh, I get I get um, patients coming in who are diagnosed with polycystic ovaries, and it's a common kind of a thought process that if you have a polycystic ovaries, you've got a huge ovary. So if you if you go back to this little diagram, this is a normal ovary. In patients who have polycystic ovaries, you get this kind of necklace-like an appearance of the this um, follicles. So you, do you see the small holes, which are like a small follicles or the cysts? So they're all eggs in your ovary, which you're born with. When you start menstruating every month, one of these egg will mature, gets ovulated and come out. But when you have polycystic ovaries, these eggs are not releasing. They are just on the surface of the ovary, but not getting released. Now, polycystic ovaries, um, and they have small cysts, but they're only around 10 millimeter in size. So they're not big. Therefore, they don't cause any pain and they don't have any big cyst on ovary. So it's and it doesn't cause major uh, changes in the ovaries in terms of size, and it doesn't cause pain. So if anybody says, I've got polycystic ovaries and I've got pain, it doesn't happen that way. Now, polycystic ovaries are scan diagnosis. Polycystic ovary and syndrome are two out of three features. So either they have a scan uh, features, and then uh, second is you may have um, uh, irregularity of menstrual cycle. And the third feature is high androgen level, which is male, male hormone, which is testosterone. So traditionally, people who have polycystic ovaries can have slightly high testosterone level. And two out of three makes that as a polycystic ovary syndrome. It's not that uncommon, polycystic ovaries. Uh, almost two to 20, uh, I mean, it's, it's reported in a variety, but almost one in um, 20 women are born with polycystic ovaries. 
And the polycystic ovaries, um, if are diagnosed sometimes on, on a scan, which was done for different reason, you may not even know that you have polycystic ovaries because you've got regular periods, you've got uh, no problem with getting a pregnant, and uh, then scan showed you have polycystic ovaries. Yes, you have polycystic ovaries, but they're not causing any problem for you, and hence don't need treatment because nobody can, um, nobody can, can, um, uh, can um, cure polycystic ovaries. And if they're not causing any problem to you, it doesn't need any treatment. So what are the common presentation can cause irregular periods? And some people to an extreme spectrum may not have any periods. It, as I said, it polycystic ovarian syndrome, there's some, this patients or this woman will have slightly high male level hormones, which is called testosterone, and hence may have slightly more growth, a more uh, tendency towards having male pattern of hair growth. Uh, some people have, um, uh, and they can be slightly overweight or maybe very overweight, and they may uh, find it difficult on losing the weight. Some people have acne, and if you're not, or if you're not having regular periods, you may find difficult to conceive. What are the treatments for it? Healthy lifestyle is most important. Even if you have overweight and you find it difficult to uh, to lose weight, you we will first and foremost ask you to consider uh, losing weight by having um, either seeing a dietitian or see a GP to see anything helps in community. Having a healthy lifestyle, um, making sure you follow a diet pattern, take help from um, things like um, places like uh, Slimming World, uh, whichever works for you. Regular exercise um, and um, less consumption of any uh, high fat or carbohydrate, right, uh, which will help. Then weight loss, if you're overweight, is very important. And without that, not much can be achieved. Then polycystic ovaries need to be treated only depending on what, what um, symptoms is causing you. So if it's causing you uh, irregularity of menstrual cycle, or if it's not causing, if it's causing you no periods at all, then you will need three to four periods in a year to protect your lining of the womb. Because if you don't have any periods, then constant increased hormones can make your lining of the womb abnormal. And hence you need something called progesterone tablet for seven days, at least three to four times a year to, to protect your lining of the womb so that you should have three to four periods a year. Then um, for if your periods are regular and you're not planning for a pregnancy, then you can have either oral contraceptive pill or you can have progesterone only pill or a mirana coil for an example. This hormone containing coil will keep regulating your lining of the womb, will keep supporting it up, and you may get better. If you have excess hair growth, oily skin, acne, you can try a pill called a Dianet pill, which has got slightly anti androgenic effect, which may help. But if it continues to grow, then you might have to see an endocrinologist, or, uh, or at some point, you may have to see a dermatologist or any expert to help you with. Um, with um, acne or um, uh, hirsutism. Um, if you are finding it difficult to conceive and you have polycystic ovaries and you're not able to ovulate, that is the eggs are not getting released, then you may need a further fertility treatment with a with fertility specialist. And most of the time, simple medication like clomiphene will kickstart your ovaries uh, to produce egg. But if you're overweight, as I said, if you lose weight, it also kickstarts your ovaries. And occasionally, we may have to give you metformin, uh, which is a medication which helps to, to regulate insulin because patients who have got polycystic ovaries may have higher level of resistance to insulin hormones. If you have polycystic ovaries, if you try to want to read something on it, uh, Google can give you a lot of jargon and it's very difficult. Uh, I would recommend you go to um, a Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist website, which is RCOG website. And there is a patient information leaflet. We just have to search for patient information leaflet on polycystic ovary um, and our, on RCOG website. And that's a quite a good tool for you to know about polycystic ovaries. Then endometriosis, um, that's again a common, common one um, where the, so the lining of the womb, which is this one, which is shed every um, cycle is is also is sometimes found in in your pelvis which is called endometriosis with so lining of the wounds called 
endometrium shed every cycle but sometimes it's found outside the pelvis which is called endometriosis now why it happens nobody knows there's so many theories but endometriosis uh, we don't know why it happens endometriosis only is a problem um, I mean mainly is only a problem in the reproductive age group after you go into menopause endometriosis usually doesn't cause any symptoms and problem um, endometriosis can present uh, some people have no symptom endometriosis and we do a keyhole surgery for some other reason and say hi on, you got some endometriosis it doesn't need treatment in that case if you got no symptoms but endometriosis can present um, with quite painful heavy periods it can also present with pain during sexual intercourse it can also present pain uh, while um, uh, you're opening bowel if it's a severe form of endometriosis and infiltrating into your bowel and sometimes if it's in bladder it can present with bladder symptoms as well now it really depends on what symptoms you're getting the investigation for endometriosis is ultrasound scan ultrasound scan will only pick up a big cyst or endometrioma on uh, the ovaries it will not pick up the small surface endometriosis on lining of the womb uh, lining of the pelvis uh, mri can can um, detect severe form of endometriosis i.e if there's a scarring with your bowel or bowel is getting involved but again it doesn't pick up the tiny spots on the surface of the uh, of um, inside the tummy cavity the gold standard of picking up endometriosis if the scan and mri is not picking up right, is doing a keyhole surgery which is laparoscopy which is a surgery which is done in general anesthetic uh, it's done in general anesthetic and uh, it's obviously a day case procedure but as any surgery there is risk involved which is roughly around one in 300 risk of any major complications and that is a gold standard way to know whether you have endometriosis or not and if you do have endometriosis majority of times you can treat that either excising it or endometriosis is cut out completely but if it's in a different place or it's difficult to take it out then you can burn or it's very small you can burn it off um, and it can come out uh, i mean it can come back endometriosis sometimes you have very severe form of endometriosis which is when your bowel is stuck your blood is stuck or if you it involves your ureter which is tubed and you get into bladder in that case the treatment for the treatment is done in endometriosis centers not uh, in benetton because then severe endometriosis are done in a specialist unit with a combined approach with uh, a colorectal surgeon and sometimes it involves urologist as well and not and all endometriosis needs um, laparoscopy if your symptoms can be managed and if you're happy to manage them with uh, painkillers or oral contraceptive pill or other things like mirena coil or depot injection then you can manage them and last resort for treating any heavy painful periods secondary to endometriosis is a hysterectomy which which does help if nothing else works on the patients pelvic inflammatory disease as i said to you pelvic inflammatory disease is not uh, often seen in outpatient because it presents when it presents it presents in very acute form when patients have got severe pain and um, uh, discharge or sometimes it can form abscess uh, pelvic infection is usually this is lining of the womb this is ovary it goes from here and then it can form abscess or a lot of adhesions and this is things like chlamydia gonorrhea and if you have a and this is usually treated with antibiotics not surgical but until unless there is an abscess if the abscess is formed then you will need a surgery to drain the abscess because antibiotics don't work usually when the abscesses are formed and you become quite sick um, this is commonly sexually transmitted uh, problems uh, but it can also come from um, a lost uh, coil for a long time if you left the coil for a long time and you don't you forgot about it sometimes you get a pelvic infection and abscesses because of the coil but usually it can be picked up sooner and it can be treated with antibiotic for a complete cure uh, menopause is the next um, uh, issue which does affect unfortunately every woman when they um, um, uh, in their life lifetime not everybody will be symptomatic though some people go through menopause without uh, having any symptoms uh, the average age is roughly around 51 and we often uh, diagnose men menopause with absence of menstruation uh, for 12 months perimenopause is um, a, a, a time when 
you are not into menopause, you still have the periods, but it can be variable. Um, uh, it may um, be irregular. It may start getting heavier, or you start getting symptoms like hot flushes uh, and um, night sweats uh, that get put perimenopausal. Uh, and that can last for variable time. It can last from six months, a year, or even maybe more. Uh, most of the time, to die, they, doing a blood test to confirm whether you are going to perimenopause and then, uh, is not useful or beneficial and doesn't give us any um, any kind of um, uh, insight. So usually there's no need for blood test. But if you're symptomatic, then you can go for treatment. And treatment depends on your symptoms, your choice, as well as your different health conditions. If you are a very heavy smoker, if you are um, very high in your BMI, or you have a history of clot in the leg, and uh, or you have a um, history of breast cancer, or you have got history of uh, cancer of the lining of the womb, then your choices become quite limited. If you are, uh, if um, you've got healthy lifestyle, you've got normal weight, and you don't have um, other issues which I've just mentioned, HRT. Um, can be started and that most of the time it can be discussed with your general practitioner and they can start and that gives you a lot of health benefit overall um, um, and it is shown to have a lot of health benefit uh, to, um, to, a, to a woman and I strongly feel that um, a, a female's body go through a lot of trauma when they go through a lack of hormone phase in future. A healthy lifestyle is the key and whether you try it on the hormones or not, healthy lifestyle is the key. So you may like to start um, thinking what you eat, drink, uh, smoking and exercises. So you might have to stop smoking, reduce your alcohol intake, optimize your weight, go for more out exercises because all those are really important for your bone health, your mental health, as well as your uh, physical health. And obviously, if you need, you can start the HRT. Uh, HRT is in uh, our uh, combination of estrogen and progesterone. Progesterone is only needed if you still have the womb. And the whole idea of progesterone is to protect the lining of the womb. If you don't have a womb, you don't need progesterone. Estrogen can be given through oral gel or patches. Whichever is useful for you, um, you can try those. Progesterone, as I said, is mainly for patients who are... Uh, um, uh, who are um, have um, in the womb. If you do, if I had a hysterectomy in the future, then you don't need progesterone. You can have only estrogen HRT, which is probably much more safer um, than combining with the progesterone. Um, if you have a previous history of clot in the leg, then we usually give you the patches so that it bypasses the the, the liver. And irrespective of whether you want to have a systemic HRT or not, vaginal estrogens for a patient who are in menopausal age group is really important because a lot of patients in late in, 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 in uh, their life, they have a lot of discomfort in the vaginal area. Uh, then they can present with drawings like a um, dragging sensation, get uh, um, symptoms of uh, recurrent urinary tract infection, pain, and having some estrogen in the vagina is a local hormone which doesn't have it doesn't come in your bloodstream that much and therefore it's very safe and vaginal estrogen can be very good and uh, for if you get all the symptoms in the future menopause hrt only works well if you start earlier than later if you're left it for a long time and then go into deeply into menopause then hrt may not help however vaginal estrogens can be taken any time of your uh, of your menopausal um, age group. Then more of these are touch. This is um, this is a treatment, uh, and that's mainly for vaginal um, atrophy for the patients or thinness of the lining of the womb, a th thinness of the lining of the vagina, which can present with recurrent UTI discomfort, vaginal dryness. Um, there are more and more evidence coming out, um, and there's still. Um, um, the, the evidence is still um, getting um, evaluated, but um, the safety profile, I think, is very safe. I don't personally do this procedure. There's um, one of my colleagues, Mr. Connell. He's the, he's the one who does this procedure in Venom. It's a day case. Uh, it's, a, it's not painful. Uh, it's um, a probe which goes in and produces the laser, uh, and that helps to um, um, 
helps you with the vaginal dryness and pain. Usually this is reserved for patients who have breast cancer and uh, they are not um, able to take the vaginal estrogen or if they have taken vaginal estrogen but their vaginal symptoms are still bothering them and then they can try this uh, Mono Lisa Touch uh, for the vaginal symptoms. And that's, as I said, used with a small probe. It delivers low power um, energy, which is laser, and it stimulates the growth of collagen and new blood vessels. And that's how it helps to manage the proper balance for the vaginal mucosa. Then, um, as I said, uh, incontinence prolapse itself is quite a big subject, uh, but pelvic organ prolapse can happen with uh, at any age group. Um, and it's not only related with, uh, with menopausal or older age group, it can happen in younger age group as well. Uh, however, it's more common uh, for older age group, purely, uh, purely because when we all go older, our support, supporting tissues do get weaker and menopause also makes the uh, tissues bigger. So in this diagram, if it's a two-dimensional picture, front thing you notice is the bladder, which drains water out. Then on the back, you have a womb, a vagina, and the back passage. Then if the, the, when the prolapse comes down in the middle, which is the womb, it's called uterine prolapse. When the bladder sacks into the vagina, it's called cystocele. And when the bowel comes to the vagina, it's called rectocele. And now, the commonest risk factor for this is um, repeated straining, like chronic constipation, lifting heavy weights, chronic cough, menopause, as I said, and vaginal birth. So vaginal birth, especially if you have a forceps delivery, it can give a lot of trauma, trauma to pelvic floor, and that can cause um, uh, prolapse. Hysterectomy, um, no, wound prolapse, the treatment can be vaginal hysterectomy, uh, whether it's, which is one of the treatment for um, wound prolapse. However, if you have no prolapse and you have a hysterectomy, it does, um, it does um, increase your chance of a prolapse of the vagina in the future because we are we, when we do a hysterectomy, we do have to cut the support structure of the womb to get the womb out. And uh, again, if you have a lot of overweight, it could, does put the pressure on the pelvic area. Now, treatment of pelvic organ prolapse is depending on your symptoms. So first and foremost, we like you to optimize weight, avoid lifting heavy weights, when constipation, um, pelvic floor exercises, see the pelvic floor physiotherapist. As I said, here we have um, three um, continent scanner specialist who does pelvic floor exercises and can help with your, your symptoms, as well as go through the blood retraining. We talked a lot about um, the general estrogens, which can help to make your symptoms better. And then there's something called vaginal pessary, which is like a ring or comes in a different size. It goes in the vagina. It needs to be changed every four to six months. It's not a cure for a prolapse, but it's a symptomatic correction of the prolapse. Um, and uh, it needs to be changed four to six months. And surgery is the, uh, surgery is the option which is um, reserved for patients who are either got quite a large prolapse or they are symptomatic, i.e., they feel the pulse, their quality of life is getting disturbed, or um, it's starting to affect their organ function, like difficulty to empty the bladder or the bowel. Some people have to push it, the, the prolapse back into the vagina. The, the option for prolapse option depends on if your bladder is coming down here in the front, which is called cystocele, then we do a repair from the front. So we go through the vagina, open this area, push the bladder back in, bring the tissues together, suture it up, do the similar thing on the back of the vagina through, through this. And for the womb prolapse, the commonest option is either doing a vaginal hysterectomy or there are alternative hysterectomy, which is sacrospinous fixation, where we stitch the neck of the womb with a very strong ligament here called sacrospinous ligament. Or the last option is use of the mesh. Uh, and mesh surgeries are increasingly under high vigilance restriction, and we don't offer any mesh surgeries here in that area. Sometimes after hysterectomy, your top of the vagina can come down, which is called vault prolapse. If that happens, then the options are uh, we can re-stitch the, uh, the top of the vagina with a strong ligament called sacrospinous ligament, or we um, or alternative is a mesh. And sometimes when all the options have failed or the prolapse has come back again, and if you have completed, and if you're not sexually active and you have no desire of having a sexual activity, then Sometimes there's a procedure called corpoclesis where we may um, uh, try to close the vaginal um, um, 
vaginal orifice so that the prolapse doesn't come down. This is only reserved for patients who have failed the treatment uh, and they are not desirous of any further surgical treatment in the future. Um, the prolapse operation is usually one to two nights in hospital. Complete recovery takes four to six weeks. Uh, and um, uh, we ask you not to lift heavy weights in future. Don't get constipated. Keep doing your pelvic floor exercises because prolapse can come back in future. So something to keep in mind. Uh, but as I said, it's a big uh, topic in itself. I'll cover it a bit more with my next webinar on incontinent prolapse. But my past webinars are also available for you to have a look at on our, on our site. Uh, then incontinence. So incontinence, bladder incontinence can be two types or sometimes it can be mixed. One is called overactive uh, over incontinence, typically present with frequency and urgency. So your bladder is not able to hold uh, the urine for that long. So what your bladder is doing is constantly doing this. So it typically presents when you have a, when you go into waterworks often, you are not able to hold uh, much in the bladder, somewhere around 50 to 150 mils. Uh, and you may have to get up in the night. Sometimes you get typical lock and key, uh, lock and key um, kind of phenomena, i.e. you burst into pool for waterworks. As soon as you put key in the, in the in, in your door, you start leaking. And the um, uh, sound of water can sometimes give you the same kind of effect. The best, uh, the, the treatment for um, urgency or incontinent frequency, the lifestyle adjustment first, which is, uh, when pelvic floor exercises, making sure we don't we uh, try to ask you to put decaffeinated stuff, like excessive coffee, tea, fizzy drinks, alcohol are not good for bladder. Uh, and then bladder retraining, which is to train your bladder to hold more and more. And this has been taught to you by our continent care specialist. Then there are medications for the bladder, which is either two types. One uh, stops the bladder contraction, and other medication helps to relax. The one which helps to stop the contractions, uh, does give some side effects like dry mouth and constipation, but if you adjust, then, uh, then it helps. The other which helps to relax the bladder, uh, which is slightly different mechanism section, uh, is more safer in elderly age group, and that doesn't give that kind of side effects. If that doesn't work, then we go for what is called a bladder Botox. So that's a small camera, it goes in the bladder, which is called cystoscope, and with an injection, we inject um, the, the Botox on the bladder wall. What it does, it relaxes the bladder. It works very well, but in one in 12 women, sometimes it relaxes the bladder so well that you are not able to empty the bladder. You may have to uh, catheterize yourself. It's more horrible what it sounds, but if the patient's quality of life is really disturbed with this, uh, then after we teach you how to catheterize yourself, is actually not a big problem for most of the patients. And then once they know what it involves, they usually are uh, very accommodating because the quality of life is really disturbed because of this. And then if this doesn't work, then um, there is this, there's something called second nerve modulation where we put a little uh, transducer in your near your backbone, which helps to regulate uh, the bladder. It doesn't, um, it is not done at Benetton and it's not done in most of the NHS hospital. It's only done in some few um, uh, tertiary unit. And then something called posterior tibial nerve stimulation. Um, it's mixed results of that, and that's uh, that's done by the specialist uh, uh, specialist nurses who can stimulate bit of the tibial nerves, uh, and that may help with your uh, bladder symptoms. But it's not a first line treatment, but it doesn't give any harm, um, and it's uh, mostly available on a private basis most of the places. Stress incontinence is slightly different. This is when you leak, involuntary leak, when you cough, sneeze. So that's your bladder. That's the sphincter which holds the bladder. And when you cough and sneeze, this area that's weakened, your tube doesn't close, and then the water leaks. So this is common when you are coughing, sneezing, lifting weight, sexual intercourse, or any high impact exercises like trampling with kids. Uh, again, lifestyle modification is always welcome in. Pelvic floor exercises are the key. That doesn't work then we do um, we do offer the surgeries which can be a bulking which is shown in here which is a procedure which is day case procedure use of a permanent gel mainly repeating it's a less in, least invasive option we have a look inside we give you local anesthetic injections here with a uh, look inside the bladder we give four sites injection which perks that area up 
and uh, it can it's a day case procedure. So what we call is an office procedure. So you can go uh, and you can have it and go home. There's no downtime with it, um, and it can be local as a procedure. That's the advantage. The advantage is it's the least. Um, it it is successful in 55 to 60 percent of the patients, and we may need to repeat it. Corpus suspension and abdominal sting surgery. They both don't use any meshes. Uh, are major surgeries. Uh, they take six to eight weeks for a complete recover, recovery. It is more effective than bulking. It's got eight to, um, it's got 80, 80, around 85 percent chance of success. 60 to 80, uh, six to eight weeks of recovery period. Uh, but sometimes when you put more support in that area, it can overcorrect um, the um, weakness and. One in ten women may find it after the operation may not be able to pass urine well. May need to be taught how to catheterize yourself. Till such time, things do settle down. A majority of patients it does settle down, and it's affecting on eighty to eighty-five percent of the patients. Um, I'll hand over at this point to Sarah. Um, the, there's a patient testimony, as I said in the beginning, which will tell us uh, about uh, how the journey of the patients are at Bedford Hospital, and may give you a bit more insight as well. So, uh, Sarah, to you. Yes, this is a patient who um, came here for a hysterectomy and um, she gives a very informative um, talk about her experiences here. I'm Claire. Um, I had a hysterectomy because I was struggling with my periods. They were very, very heavy, painful. I also had some fibroids, um, but actually at the time of having it, it was also discovered that I had some endometriosis too. I had years of problems with my periods. Um, it had now got to the stage where I probably had one week out of a month where I was feeling okay. Um, with the build up to it, so I then also discovered I had PMDD, so it wasn't just PMS, my, my whole mental health as well was being affected by it. I sat down with Mr Gupta um, and he was absolutely fantastic. pre-assessment with a fantastic nurse. She went through everything. She was so thorough. Um, when I came in on the day, the staff in the ward were fantastic. Again, just asked me if I understood what was going to happen on the day and how I was going to feel. I had lovely nurses. They were really good to me, really looked after me. The facilities were great. I had my own room, ensuite bathroom, uh, TV in the room everything that I needed really. It was like home from home. Recovery has been amazing, far better than I could have ever hoped for. I really expected to be at home in bed for six weeks, you know, really struggling to get on with life. But life has returned to normal and even a better normal actually now because I feel like I've got more energy. I'd highly recommend using Benenden because I didn't have the waiting times that other people are experiencing, but the surgery in itself was fantastic and a service that I wouldn't have received elsewhere. Definitely go and speak to their GP, first of all, but really just seek advice and help. Don't suffer in silence because I think too often we are told that it's something else or there's, there's nothing wrong or it's normal, but definitely get some help with it as early as you can. So I'm Sarah and I'm a surgical care practitioner who works with the gynaecology team here at Benenden. I originally trained in the 1980s and my favourite ward was the gynae ward and I also enjoyed working in theatre. So for me I now have the dream job working with the gynaecology patients and assisting in theatre and um, this enabled me to complete a degree as well so I've furthered my education, which has also been of great benefit to me. Um, this just gives you an overview of my role. 
Um, I triage most of the gynae referrals that we receive at the hospital and make sure patients see the right consultant. I um, see patients before their surgery for pre-op assessment and you know, hopefully I see as many as I can. Uh, we have a great team who see the ones that I can't. Um, I visit patients on the ward with consultants before their operations and then assist in theatre with the surgery itself. And hopefully I get a chance to visit the patients on the ward post-op before they go home, make sure they can understand what their operations involved and answer any questions. Some patients I do a telephone follow-up and um, other parts of my role involve helping out in our ambulatory care unit where we do hysteroscopies and cystoscopies that's checking inside the womb and also checking inside the bladder and I also have sort of admin related jobs checking the theatre list orders um, answering any patient queries and that sort of thing. Um, we'll now take some questions um, the first one is treatment for fibroids hasn't worked for me and I'm interested in a hysterectomy. If I had a consultation, would there be a period where I can go away and decide to go ahead or not? Um, if you have fibroids and you've tried, uh, tried uh, the way uh, treatment hasn't worked, hysterectomy is an option and uh, it really depends on... Um, it, it, when, once we do a consultation with you, then you will be counseled uh, uh, about uh, the option and also we discuss about hysterectomy. And as I said, most of the hysterectomy fibroids until the big one can be done through keyhole surgery, um, which is a laparoscopic hysterectomy. Uh, but obviously we will go through pros and cons. And when you come to see us in the clinic, we explain um, all the pros and cons. And if, if you have any previous surgeries, like previous Cesarean sections or previous cut in the tummy or previous uh, infection, then obviously, or severe endometriosis, then obviously it makes you go into higher risk. If you didn't have any previous major surgeries, then um, you are still, and complications can happen on any, and, and during any operation, but that doesn't make you relatively on that high risk pathway. So we'll go through pros and cons, discuss everything with you, and then we do provide you with patient information leaflets to read. And uh, if uh, then you need to have a bit of time to think about your options and come for a follow up or do a telephone consultation, obviously that 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 will be always. Um, uh, uh, I mean, if you did need more time, then uh, that's absolutely a yes. As long as you have full understanding as well as you're um, informed, uh, and uh, you make your decision on well in, after. Um, processing the information and you're well informed, that's the right thing to do for a patient and a doctor. And that's time we need to go through and proceed for operation. But yeah, absolutely, you will have to be well informed with your choices as well as what risk benefit is uh, pertaining to you yourself. And some are generic, but that is important for being specific for some patients. Next question, can fibroids return after treatment? Yeah, fibroids can come back. Um, after treatment because uh, they're mostly, uh, what we know of fibroids, they are uh, hormonally um, linked. Um, uh, they, they can come after um, taking them out. Um, usually fibroids, uh, and that will only happen if you're in a reproductive age group. Uh, once you go into menopause, the fibroids should not come back. And if they do uh, are coming back or increasing in size, then we'll have to be suspicious, though majority of fibroids are benign and we treat as a benign growth. But if it's uh, coming back after menopause and they're growing up, then we have to be suspicious. But during the reproductive age group, the fibroids can come back, yes. Next question. My job involves standing for most of the day. After a hysterectomy, when would you say I could return to work? So usually um, laparoscopic hysterectomy has got slightly quicker recovery. Open hysterectomy takes a bit of time. Vaginal hysterectomy is again, if you're suitable, uh, they have a really quick recovery. Uh, but ballpoint figure is six to eight weeks, but it really depends on the individuals, as you said very, very rightly, it depends on what uh, your jobs are. So if your job is quite heavy and quite physical, 
most of the uh, most of the healing has taken place in eight weeks time so i wouldn't expect anything going wrong after eight weeks however you may struggle because of scarring and going through a major operation and that's the best time when you have to phase yourself into the work rather than going straight into a very heavy lifting and um, working long hours on your feet but the best person then to have the assessment is your manager uh, and your occupational health because what your job involves they know the best what your job involves but usually all the healing has taken place in six to eight weeks time and after that it's just a matter of um, how uh, well you feel uh, recovering from major surgery regarding the, the specific work you do next question i have a bulge in my vagina i'm waiting an appointment with a gynecologist not sure what's wrong with me yet. Is it safe for me to still do yoga, Pilates, and swimming? Yeah, I, if bulge in the vagina, which you're describing, is probably uh, maybe a prolapse which you have. And uh, while you're waiting to be seen, if you want to do yoga, Pilates, swimming, they're absolutely fine and probably good for you. Um, it should also, only thing which I would like to say that you should avoid is lifting heavy weights um, uh, and constipation. Apart from that, you can pretty much do anything which is your day-to-day -day life. And some people also come and ask me whether I've got a prolapse. Uh, well, intercourse can harm me. Its answer is no. Intercourse will not harm you. Uh, yoga will not. It will be in fact good for you. And uh, Pilates will be good for you because it's core muscles. Uh, but if you are taking, uh, uh, if you are um, with an instructor and you take, uh, 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 you're doing your classes, say spin classes or anything else, it's worth mentioning it to instructor that you're under investigation for them. Um, and that's to avoid the high impact kind of exercises. Uh, what do you do for clitoral cysts deeper inside? Also, do you treat lichen sclerosis? Yeah, uh, so I'll talk about clitoral cyst in, the, in, the, in a minute. If you, it's a clitoral cyst which is painful, uh, then we can take it out. But it's a very tricky area to have a cyst. And if um, localized, because it's a very sensitive part of the skin, um, uh, sometimes local anesthetic doesn't work and general anesthetic may be required to take it out. Uh, the cyst can be taken out, but we will always counsel you for scarring and uh, sensory changes or sometimes you may find that uh, it, it is um, um, you, you, because it's a very sensitive area of the body it, it can give you some sensory disturbance or or neuro uh, or um, um, some uh, nerve um, kind of changes uh, and after the cyst is removed uh, but majority of patients are okay but that is a standard counseling because we don't know how much uh, um, of uh, once that cyst is taken out and the scarring will affect uh, the sensation in that area. So that will be the counseling. Second, lichen sclerosis, yes, we do diagnosis as well as treatment for lichen sclerosis. Uh, I mean, for today, we did a verbal biopsy uh, to confirm the lichen sclerosis in ambulatory care unit here in the local anesthetic, which is a little biopsy from the skin, which goes to the lab to be looked at. And uh, we do treatment for lichen sclerosis. If the treatment uh, we do, um, uh, which is uh, with a use of steroid cream as well as uh, hormones, most of the patients will work very well. If you find that it's not working well, then we do. We have our onboard dermatologist uh, uh, here who are quite. Uh, we work in quite a good partnership, and we can always take help from each other mm -hmm. if it doesn't get resolved. Um, and the symptoms do continue, but majority of patients it does get uh, sorted. The next question, my daughter has issues with irregular heavy bleeding whilst on the progesterone only pill. Yeah. She also has thrush regularly and has been treated for pelvic inflammatory disease. Her GP seems reluctant to change her pill and just keeps doing swabs. Is there anything you could do to help? And if you can, what should we ask her GP to refer her for? So if uh, if it, if um, she's getting heavy irregular period and also uh, bleeding um, irregular on pushed on the pill, that's one of the reasons for referral. That's important. Uh, and then once um, once uh, and I I don't know what age your daughter is because uh, uh, and we only see adult patients who are eighteen years and above in um, in uh, Berlin and uh, in um, Berlin. Uh, and if um, 
you will get an uh, ultrasound scan to make sure there's lining of the womb and, is, and there's no fibroid or anything else. Uh, we may have to examine to see what the neck of the womb is doing and uh, see whether there's anything else is causing up. And then we can change. And if the pelvic inflammatory disease has been treated, then we can change from progesterone pill, which itself can cause irregular bleeding and uh, spotting, to a combined pill or a midana coil. Um, uh, and sometimes you may need to have a look inside the womb with a little camera, which is called hysteroscopy, to evaluate the lining of the womb. So you need investigation. And then depending on what we see in the investigation, if there's no pathology treatment, then we will change for a pill to either combined oral contraceptive pill or a minera coil. Uh, and that may be more suitable than just a progesterone pill for your daughter. Thank you. Um, if you would like to discuss or book your consultation, our private patients team can take your call between eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the evening, Monday to Friday, using the number on screen. We are offering a discount for joining this session for seven days and with the terms displayed. You'll receive a short survey and I'll be grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback. Our next webinar is on knee replacement surgery. You can visit our website to sign up if you're interested. So on behalf of Mr. Abhishek Gupta and our expert team at Benenden Hospital, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today and we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you. Goodbye.